Hello and welcome to Scaling Scrum. I'm Audrey Shearer with Lightspeed and I'll be your webinar cruise director. Lightspeed is a group of trusted business agility advisors supporting lean and agile transformations worldwide. Before introducing our speaker, some logistics. This webinar is being recorded and if all goes to plan, you'll receive a link to the recording immediately after it ends. We'd love to hear from you during the presentation. If you have any questions, feel free to raise your hand. But that won't do anything as we can't see you. So please ask questions in the chat box on the bottom right. Be sure to submit them to the full audience rather than just the presenter so we can all see your questions. We'll take some questions during the presentation, but do plan to save most for the end. We are on Twitter at Lifespeed if you happen to be live tweeting or you want to connect. Okay, all right. Kicking off at exploration of scaling Scrum, we have Lifespeed Managing Agile Consultant, Luis Q. Quintella. Please call him Q. Q has more than 30 years experience in the software industry and specializes in virtualization, the cloud, DevOps, Agile, and most importantly, scaling Scrum. His presentation will be about 40 minutes and we'll save plenty of time for your questions. Take it away, Q. Okay, thank you very much, Audrey. Good morning, everybody, and um, welcome to what I call things you should know before scaling Scrum, which in better English, what to consider when you're scaling, when you attempt to scale Scrum. So just to make sure we are on the same page, let's do a trial poll to see your opinion about what day of the week is today. We still have a couple of folks joining, so. All right, the poll is closed and we have our results. Hundred percent Friday, Q. Okay, good. So everybody's in better shape than I am. I usually don't know what day of the week it is. That's why I keep asking. Okay, so without much more delay, this presentation is basically going to cover five things. Reasons for scaling Scrum. Why would you do that? Before you try scaling, things you should consider quite seriously. Uh, facilitating communication, keeping it simple, and what steps you can take to adopt scaling if you determine that to be the, the, the route you want to go. Sorry if I disappoint you, but we are not going to discuss what scaling framework is better. And I absolutely refuse to engage on a scaling framework war. Very common topic. Everybody wants to say my framework is better than yours. That's not what this presentation is all about. I uh, have a little summary here, the things that I learned sometimes painfully the last four or five years or so. And that's what we're going to discuss. So, why do you really want to scale? And before that, we had another poll, so I know why, what's the level of, of uh, scaling that everybody that's attending this presentation is at up. All right, a couple more seconds. We've got 60% voted, so I think we'll go ahead and close it. Okay, so what we have as results, Audrey, if you would like to read them back. Yeah, so we've got 44% not scaling Scrum currently, 11% plan to scale in six months, 22% within the next year, and 22% currently scaling Scrum with some issues. Okay, excellent. So, the two main reasons we scale Scrum is we want to complete functionality more rapidly 
So we want to apply more teams to work to the product backlog and hopefully get that backlog completed faster than we would otherwise. Or in some cases, we need to apply more people for a few sprints to accommodate some demands that only one team cannot take care of in a reasonable amount of time. So sometimes it's, it's a temporary scaling, you know, having more resources and people apply to a project or a product. And sometimes it's a permanent solution. You have uh, always a high volume of items on the backlog and uh, you decide that would be better served by multiple teams working it. So those, those are the two main reasons we, we do scale. Now, after that, there are some interesting considerations. One is, there are three things about scaling, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And the good is, all the basic values, principles, artifacts, roles, meetings, everything that Scrum is all about, apply whether Scrum is singular or is scaled. So things don't, don't, don't change from the basics of Scrum. They are there for the same purposes that they were there with it's only a single team. You have to control risk, you have to enhance creativity, you have to grow your productivity, you have to always be very transparent so everybody knows where everything is at a given time. So that's the good side of it. Everything is pretty much what you know, just at a larger, pun intended, scale. Then we have the bad part. The more teams you put working together, obviously you're going to increase the number of interactions, complexities, and events. There'll be a lot more of those things, right? When in a team we talk on average five, six, seven people, some large teams may go up to nine. That's a lot of communication. Well, then you multiply that by multiple teams. So events tend to be larger. There's a lot more complexity that gets added to it. Then the ugly part, the relationship between productivity and creativity is never linear. So it's a common assumption that people make in the beginning. I made that myself. Well, if one team is great, 10 is 10 times better. Um, it doesn't work that way because there's so much more complexity involved. Yes, you may get more output, but there will be a price to pay in complexity, in managing the complexity, in all the interactions that happen, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not linear. If you put a team that can do X amount of things, you put 10 teams, you're not going to get 10 times the output. So a product owner or whoever is making the decision to create a scaling uh, environment for Scrum needs to very be very careful about weighting the benefits and costs, the pros and cons. Is this, a, okay, is this going to cost me more, but am I going to get significantly more? Yes or no. So those are the three things, the good, the bad, and the ugly. It's a still scrum, and uh, then there's the complexity, and then there's the fact that the relationship is not linear. Okay, whether or not you are scaling, I recommend you consider these things. Those are common dysfunctions that happen in single teams, especially when they are not mature, and they'll be very much amplified if you scale without preparing properly to do so. The first one is vision and priority. It's a very, unfortunately, common situation where teams lack proper business and technical vision and the priority is constantly changing for each sprint. It's uh, the case where the product owner sometimes is very immature in the role 
and uh, or the organization itself is new to Scrum and uh, it doesn't understand the the implications of making changes in direction over and over again. So these are very common situations, and I've seen in my experience they get quite worse the more teams you add there if you keep happening to have no clear vision and shifting priorities constantly. Priorities can shift, and it's a good thing in Scrum that you adapt quickly, but you have to be very careful how often you shift things around. The second thing to consider is velocity. We talk a lot about velocity in Scrum, right? Single team, multiple teams, everybody talks about velocity. Two points that are very common, a dysfunction in a single team and get amplified quite often is the business, quote unquote, they do not believe they're getting enough value from the teams. Well, whatever they produce is not enough. Then it's very common, unfortunately, that someone, whoever the someone may be, comes with some bright ideas like, oh, let's start a competition between the teams and, and uh, we can reward the team with the highest velocity. Uh, obviously, I don't think I need to explain to anybody how bad this can turn into. Quality, it's a major issue in single teams and get amplified the more teams you have working on a product. They finish the sprint, but then we have a lot of technical debt that get generated. It can be just bugs. And even if you don't have bugs, you have poor design choices. I mean, performance issues, um, unable to scale up a system and things like that. But by God, we got everything done by the end of the sprint. Dependency hell. It's unfortunately that as much as we always emphasize the fact that we need vertical slicing, we still have separate teams that work in front end and back end, or one team does search, the other team does the business rules and all that stuff. That is going to cut through different components and, uh, and uh, it creates lots of dependency. The back-end team cannot do much if the front-end is not ready, and then the front-end team are waiting for the back-end team to finish. So it's always good to think about the, the vertical slicing and try to eliminate horizontal slicing, which is still very common to find. And uh, the next one is what I call water scrum fall. Uh, I seen that quite a bit, is when the development organization itself is in Scrum, and sometimes it's actually very good at doing Scrum, and nobody else in the company really understands that. So work gets done in the development department, and then you have to go to 36 different gates to put actually in production. So it's, it's a situation that, again, gets magnified quite exponentially when you have multiple teams working in a, in a product. So those are single team dysfunctions, but they're very, very enlarged when you have multiple teams. Speaking of considerations, I always like to remind people of this. The larger and the older an organization it is, it's very common to find, hey, we just need more bureaucracy on top of every bureaucracy we have because, well, we have more teams. So we have to guarantee that uh, everything is in place and uh, let's put another couple layers of management and bureaucracy here. I look over this a little bit down the road, but I think you always should think about descaling things, you know, simplifying bureaucracy. The simpler it is, the easier it is to get results. But again, that's a common problem in all older organizations and large organizations. 
So what's the scaling? Well, scaling Scrum, scaling Agile, any kind of scaling, it's about facilitating better communication. Your whole target is to facilitate communication between the teams, between everybody that's involved in the process. And always remember that when things go wrong in any kind of relationship, it's usually because communication failed. So if you want to be successful in adopting a scaling solution, make sure that your first and utmost priority is to have efficient lines of communication. So what is Q talking about? When you facilitate conversations, when you have people discussing common problems, when, when people communicate, it's very easy to prevent dictated solutions. If you don't have communication, somebody is going to dictate ways of doing the work, ways of doing the architecture, ways of accomplishing tasks, and that just creates a flutter of problems down the road. Another thing is physical boundaries. You know, for instance, two teams working the same project or product are in uh, two different buildings, and uh, it's hard to see each other. They can see their boards, uh, even with uh, software and webcams and etc. There is always a little bit of friction there to get everybody on the same page. Let alone if they are in different cities or even in different countries. So try to minimize or eliminate as much as possible any physical boundary to communication. Another thing is be very careful with management, create invisible boundaries. I, uh, I've seen that quite a bit in, in, in scaling implementations where uh, there was resistance from some managers to let their teams talk to the other teams and the, and all sorts of stuff without involving them and using them as a bottleneck and etc. So they are the hard boundaries and they are the soft boundaries, the invisible ones. Honestly, it's about getting the practice that works and not just looking for something additional to implement. Sometimes you have a solution that's working really well. You probably can adopt the same solution even if you have multiple teams, but somebody thinks that Oh, there is this practice that somebody is doing, and uh, we should just copy it. So be very careful with those. Sometimes it's not even a matter of scaling, but two teams are somehow aligned. You know, they are doing things that are similar. Um, the best thing to do is to encourage communication between those teams. You know. And uh, you don't even need a formal vehicle to do that. It can be as simple as getting somebody from one team to show up in the daily stand up to the other team and vice versa. You know, that's often quite enough to just make sure that people are up to date to what the others are doing. Uh, informal communication vehicles are always preferred to, to create structures of communication that tend to bind people to a certain way to doing stuff instead of just talking about it. Then when different teams are working the same product, think simple, a scrum of scrums, it's a very simple, very logical, very easy to implement solution. Yeah, but we have all the scaling framework, so what can you tell me about scaling frameworks? Well, like I said in the beginning, not a lot. And honestly, do you really need all those frameworks? That's something you should think very careful. I uh, know several instances, last year I actually assisted in, in a few of them, when people chose a framework just because they trained a lot of people, they spent a lot of money, and in the end they found out that um, it didn't work too well because they had, for instance, those five dysfunctions that I mentioned in the beginning, or they could have done it a lot simpler, a lot cheaper, and a lot more efficiently. So that's why I don't talk much about frameworks. I talk about 
keeping it simple. A lot of organizations, the first thing they think is the framework. It's important to choose the framework. Uh, let's pick up the most famous one, the one that such and such person created, or this one or that one. And uh, is that really what you need? Don't you first have to think how people communicate in your organization? What's the best way to do things? And then you may not even need a framework. You may just need a simple solution like Scrum of Scrums. So think about those things. Don't give more importance to the framework than to the problem at hand, which is to make teams communicate. Another advice that served me very well for the past few years is try to descale things. Removing management layers, it's a big thing because those are obstacles to communication. It's not as easy, obviously, but it, it, it's an endeavored way of taking. And uh, removing specialization, if you have specialization of any kind of a team level or at role level, Scrum always talks about the T-shaped, right? That should apply everywhere. The more specialists you have, the more likely to have bottlenecks. When you scale, you're going to need some level of standardization. Yeah, there's no way you, you cannot have some level of standardization. Now, don't get to the point that is so prescriptive that the teams just they just blend in they have no identity they have no fun all they are doing is following a prescription team happiness it's a must priority if 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 you look at the top stand over standardization or any attempt to curtail creativity in the teams is going to lead to people being unhappy. The health of the team is going to go down, and you're going to start creating many problems with that. So some level of standardization, it's key, but be very careful not to prescribe so much that people lose their own identity, and the team loses their own identity. They just become a jumble of teams. If you believe that you really want to scale, try Scrum of Scrums. It's a very simple thing for about a month, you know, or a couple of weeks, and then do a retrospective and see if that worked. Um, many times I went in places where I had these big frameworks, and uh, they found out to their surprise they were actually trying to solve a different problem than what they brought to the framework to solve. They had communication problems, and uh, they thought that just putting a framework there of any sort of framework would make that better. It didn't. So Scrum Scrums is a very good step to start when you want to try out and see if scaling it's for you. It's very simple, doesn't require much training. Uh, it's, it's a very... Um, affordable investment, and uh, it, it, it's the best way to do your first trial. Again, going back to the specialization thing, it's better to avoid what I call component teams and then go for feature teams, meaning you don't have specialists. This team does front-end, this team does back-end. It's better to spread the wealth sort of speaking, and have people in teams that can work in features and not specifically components. That can be also relatively easy to do. You can use techniques like pair programming to spread knowledge around. And there are several other things you can do, you know, community of practice, so people can share their experience and expertise and things like that. But move away from the component, from the, from the hard structure, from the specialization as much as you can, as quickly as you can. Um, you may find out sometimes that uh, a simple Scrum of Scrums does most of the work for you, but 
Frameworks in general may have a couple ideas that you can adopt. And usually you can pick up a little bit of different ideas from different frameworks and um, a different combination of tools, things here and there that work for you, you know? And uh, it's a lot better than try to adopt a single solution that you think is going to work everywhere in your organization. So a little bit of flexibility may be the planning ways of one framework, the communication of Scrum of Scrums, the community of practice that's uh, emphasized by another framework, a little bit of all these things together, it's probably what's going to work best for you without having to invest heavily in training or, or, or solutions that can be quite expensive. So my recipe, which leads almost to the end of this presentation is, when you think you're going to have to scale or you think you can benefit from scaling, get together with your teams, you know, talk to them, see what the teams think, what are the difficulties that they see in communicating with other teams, how they, how they can work together, what they see as, as difficult as obstacles, what they see as a good thing. Talk to them and then let them talk to each other without you as a product owner or scrum master or, or IT management or whatever being there, you know? And uh, then get together with all of, all of those people again and uh, get a feel for every problem, every solution, everything they flushed out from their meetings. Then do an experiment. Can be as simple as a scrum or scrums, you know, and do all those pillars of Scrum. Inspect, adapt, and repeat. And do that for a couple of weeks. And uh, you're going to see that your scaling implementation is going to go quite smoothly and uh, without trying to be very prescriptive. The more you involve the people, the more you involve the teams, the better the communication, the more successful you are. The more prescriptive you are, you're probably going to create more problems than the ones you are trying to solve. So that's pretty much my little recipe. And uh, I thank you guys very much. And I would like to open for questions right now if Audrey can help me with that part. Sure. So add any questions to the chat box. Uh, we did have some questions about SEUs, so this is going to be category F, one SEU. And while we're checking on any questions, um, if you do have bigger questions for Q, he has some slots open today at 1 p.m. Eastern for his coaching circle. What that is, is a virtual um, coaching open space, and you can get the meeting link for that by emailing us at training at lightspeed.com. Yeah, and we'll, we'll repeat the coaching circles every two weeks. Uh, it will be at different time slots to facilitate people um, um, coming to the coaching circles, but it's a great opportunity for you to talk to other folks in the industry and you know, share experiences. Uh, most of the time, people uh, are looking for solutions and somebody already has a solution for that. So it, it's not so much about Q coaching everybody, it's about everybody coaching everybody. Uh, I've been doing a number of those for, for several years. This is going to be my first one at light speed. I invite you guys to participate. It's, it's, it's a great opportunity to talk to others and, uh, uh, and share experiences. Yep, and email us at training at lightspeed.com. We'll send over the link. Um, I'm not seeing any questions. We'll give it a couple more seconds, but we do have a few events coming up at Lightspeed. The Agile DC Executive Summit is September 12th in Fairfax, and our Agile Leadership Academy Scrum Alliance Cal program is coming up September 10th and 11th. Our next webinar is Advanced Scrum Master Skills Hour. We expect that one to fill up fast, so keep an eye out on our website. And again, send any questions to Q or training at lightspeed.com and we'll get those answered. So Q, it looks like our, 
our chat is pretty clear. So thanks again for joining and we're gonna close out Scaling Scrum. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.